Welcome back, um, everyone. Um, I hope you have managed to get yourself a, a drink um, or a, a moment of a break before our final uh, panel this, e this evening. Um, and our third team is adapting. So uh, three colleagues will um, talk about their research into ways in which we have adapted our lives to um, to uh, uh, a pandemic reality and, and things that we might um, want to bring bring forward into the new normal, whatever that might be. So uh, the three colleagues who will be presenting their research in this session are Dr. Adrian Negrina, Dr. Thomas Swan and Dr. Marcus Collins. And like we have done for the previous sessions, I will introduce them individually as they begin their presentation. So um, we start with um, um, Adrian Negrina, who is um, a lecturer in quantitative, uh, quantitative social sciences here at Loughborough, and his research interests um, lie at the intersection of the sociology of cultural consumption, social stratification, and quantity research methods. And so his presentation brings us very much from communication into culture, um, uh, as his paper is entitled Digital Access to Arts and Culture Beyond um, COVID-19. So Adrian, the floor is all yours. Great, thanks, uh, Elep. Uh, first of all, I have to apologize because to, of all days, today seems to be a uh, peak allergy uh, day. So uh, yeah, I am a bit congested, but nothing too serious. Uh, so OK, so today um, I'm just, well, planning to present uh, some uh, some of the uh, very early uh, results from uh, our project uh, done in collaboration with uh, my colleague Richard Misek from University of, of Kent uh, around uh, basically what what has been happening with the uh, arts and culture uh, sector first during the uh, the pandemic uh, and then trying to uh, well think try to uh, yeah see uh, how some of the uh, some of the uh, lessons in terms of in terms of uh, the uh, digital tools that that have been used uh, for uh, many of these uh, institutions to be able to to remain open uh, to survive, hopefully, uh, can be used in the longer term on a more sustainable way. And in particular, thinking about what the potential benefits for uh, audience uh, diversity. So in that context is that our, our project is well funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Uh, as part of the RC UK uh, COVID-19 call and it's developing collaboration with, with, with Arts Council England and with the Digital Support Agency the space and uh, we are well aiming to uh, provide on, on a very expert uh, on a very exploratory uh, way that's when that's the, the nature of of, uh, of, of of our work um, a compilation of of the uh, digital innovations uh, on delivery and management of, of programming that have uh, arise as part of uh, of the uh, the well ongoing crisis uh, well this is more uh, well, this is closer to to my my own expertise. So uh, I'm I'm working uh, on developing an equality focused statistical analysis of the of of uh, arts and, and culture uh, audiences and, and programming, and we're hoping to uh, will bring all these different uh, sources of, of evidence. Uh, and to combine them in order to to produce uh, a series of of toolkits that uh, will take uh, varied forms uh, in order to uh, provide some uh, well tangible insights uh, in order to uh, well help hopefully help the sector to to uh, well provide some uh, well resilience and, and agility on uh, the uh, well the what. What we're hoping is this soon to come post-COVID uh, landscape. 
and again in particular thinking thinking about the kind of strategies that could uh, encourage audience equality and diversity. Uh, however, just very briefly, uh, in terms of the uh, context of this of this research, is that uh, well we find that uh, well historically access to arts and culture, not just in the UK but in everywhere, it's highly unequal. Uh, well, it has been widely reported uh, how uh, class, uh, socioeconomic, and uh, other uh, inequalities act as barriers. Uh, the uh, picture becomes even more complex when we uh, take a, a more intersectional approach and, and we, we combine all these with, with other, uh, well, with other uh, indicators such as uh, gender, ethnicity, disability, place of residence. It is it is not, for example, uh, how uh, female audiences seem to be more culturally active than 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 male counterparts. Uh, the effect of London, for example, and the Southwest uh, in not only in terms of the uh, cultural offering, but also in terms of in terms of uh, engagement of uh, their population and it's, it's also well well known uh, to which we can add uh, the uh, well literature related to digital technologies for cultural cultural inclusion where we have seen some positive impacts uh, for example in the uh, library library sector uh, but they mostly seem to reproduce uh, structural all of the structural or most of the structural barriers uh, identified uh, above. Uh, well, we are now in the uh, in the context of well producing uh, evidence uh, of of the impact of the of the pandemic in the in the sector, and most of the of the uh, evidence that is currently available seems to be uh, focused on workforce, and uh, there is surprisingly little on on audiences at the moment. Uh, well, the main exception being uh, some reports coming from more of the let's say consultancy and cultural cultural policy policy sectors. So uh, in no particular order, uh, we are uh, analyzing uh, well three main data sources. We could add a, a fourth uh, at audience level. We have done a survey of surveys, so uh, we explored roughly 150 studies that were launched during the uh, well during the pandemic. So from March, April 2020 till uh, well a couple of months ago. And interestingly enough, less than 10 are uh, focusing on on, on audiences, uh, among which we can we can highlight some some uh, larger national efforts. For example, the taking part survey in England. Uh, Creative Scotland in in Scotland, so more policy oriented, and again the uh, afore, aforementioned uh, policy and and consultancy uh, oriented uh, data gatherings uh, of mostly ticketing. Uh, at organizational level, uh, Richard is uh, leading uh, well interviews with cultural cultural and arts organizations of different different sizes, uh, focusing on uh, learning directly from them, what has done, what, what they have done, what has worked, uh, perceived impacts on their audiences, and interestingly enough, uh, the level of awareness or knowledge of their own audiences, which seems to be, at least to my surprise, seems to be a uh, yeah, very well important uh, issue to, to consider. We're also designing some experiments uh, which in which we're hoping to combine data analytics and survey experiments so uh, we can hopefully benefit from both modes of information in combination with with with, with interview uh, data uh, then at sectoral level uh, we are working on the analysis of the of what what I'm calling here the English field of cultural production so uh, based around the uh, Arts Council England flagships organizations, so the uh, so-called national uh, portfolio uh, organization, and we're analyzing data from their annual survey. So far, we have only uh, we only have access to uh, well pre-pandemic 
actually 12 months before the, uh, the, the pandemic. We're hoping to update this uh, soon. And here we're focusing on trying to understand the ecosystem in terms of, in terms of their uh, economies, the relationships, the uh, power that different institutions uh, have, and how they can mobilize uh, different resources and how that relates to, uh, for example, programming orientation and with more up-to-date data. Hopefully, uh, we will be able to uh, well correlate this also with, with audiences and under digital strategies. I'm going to probably skip this, but uh, it is, uh, well, I'm very excited about these, the uh, possibilities that different, different data uh, sources can offer, but at the same time, they're quite challenging. And I'm just going to highlight very briefly two challenges that, that at, at the moment seem to be the uh, some of the, the hardest. Uh, for example, audience data during lockdown, uh, it provides very scattered information and very little information on EDI and socioeconomic uh, descriptors. Uh, there are also, in the case that that data is available, there are also uh, commercial and political restrictions in the sense of uh, it seems like unless you hang out with the uh, well, right people or you are part of the right institutions, uh, it seems like it's, it's, it's almost impossible to uh, gain access to, to, uh, to some of the uh, audience and ticketing data. That's basically well, my own personal rant. Uh, but anyway, we're hoping that at the intersection of, 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 these, um, of these Venn diagram, uh, we will be able to uh, well extract uh, useful information to uh, design uh, these well toolkits for cultural institutions, while at the same time uh, being able to learn um, about well audience diversity, the role that digital technologies have played in terms of uh, diversity during the during the pandemic, and hopefully to try to well gain some insights into how how the uh, the digital can help. Uh, not only uh, during during a crisis like the pandemic, but in the longer term. So just a few snippets of uh, some very preliminary uh, findings uh, from the point of view of audience data. In this case, uh, English data from the uh, Taking Part survey, um, online uh, non probabilistic sample, small samples. Uh, we, we see that engagement on very broad categories of online engagement, uh, when we compare uh, self-identified white and uh, pain uh, subpopulations, tip to be very similar, uh, if not slightly higher for the uh, pain subsample. Uh, well, these values are too small to be statistically significant, but nonetheless, uh, when we uh, combine that with retrospective participation in the past 12 months, so before data was collected, uh, we, we can actually see the, uh, the uh, differences that, that we would expect well, as, as reported by, by previous, previous literature. Uh, at the same time, it seems like uh, intention to participate four weeks after uh, well, the uh, data, data collection uh, was declining, but nonetheless was similar uh, across both uh, sub subsamples. So perhaps there is an interesting story to, to tell uh, there if we choose not to necessarily believe on uh, p-values and statistically significance as, as our main criteria. Then if we combine uh, these, well, two now uh, different sources of information. So if we combine uh, this map, which it's literally a map that can help us to uh, trace the location of uh, of the publicly funded uh, cultural institutions. I'm not going to go through technical details on how this map was was built or the uh, multivariate uh, methods used for for this. Um, and then we see the narrative of these institutions in terms of uh, in terms of uh, well during the crisis, during the pandemic, is that we can actually see that a very powerful institution, at least on paper or on the screen, like the Tank Museum, a military museum in the Southwest, uh, seems to be very well prepared from before the pandemic, uh, having uh, 
well, being part of YouTube partner programs, making some money out of out of uh, out of their online content, and uh, working in collaboration with a video game company. Whoever not very interested on uh, knowing on trying to learn a bit more about their their audiences or having a very clear uh, idea of who the audiences of uh, of uh, of any military museum is. So we're talking about uh, white. Uh, young because of the video game connection, but also uh, middle aged and elderly uh, white speaking uh, audiences. So uh, it is very interesting to contrast that with a uh, with a with a theater, with a small theater in in, in London, uh, with a particular uh, focus on on uh, deaf audiences and uh, artists, where uh, it seems like there is a slightly more rudimentary use of digital digital tools. A lot of interest on learning more about the audiences and also uh, about uh, the potential that these tools can have to engage with their with their audiences. We were also uh, aware of of the of the limitations uh, given the uh, particular characteristics of 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 their their, their audiences. Uh, however, when we compare this to what we see on our on our map, uh, because of the uh, well different position they have, it's very clear that they have very different resources, and and uh, and it is it is it is very clear that well what they can potentially do uh, is well it's very very different. So uh, that leads us to well to question or to think, uh, you know, how to tailor different different toolkits that can actually help those institutions that are really willing and they will really want to uh, use technologies in a more efficient way uh, while not basically being uh, prescribing them to invest more money or um, or to basically well become become something that they're not uh, because that's what uh, one another institution is doing and it's able to success with that. Um, we can well. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this now because I'm I'm, I'm afraid that I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, but continuation of the analysis then can help us to understand how this e cultural ecosystem uh, is associated with, for example, uh, programming, the uh, diversity of their of the cultural cultural programming. Uh, so it's very interesting how for example the uh let's say the least powerful organizations so the ones that that have less funding less income uh less support in general are the ones that that are uh well engaging on a greater uh proportion of the programming on uh offering a more more diverse uh well variety of uh, of of, uh, of options uh while the larger organizations are well there they seem to be quite optimistic with a less than 50% of the programming uh, seems to be oriented to uh, specific communities. However, that probably means that only uh, one or two times a year they have been able to, or they have been, well, basically uh, programming something uh, around uh, different communities and their average average uh, audience. So at this stage, we have more questions than, than, than anything. Uh, we're hoping to be able to update uh, these maps and be able to get a step closer to the uh, well, hopefully the uh, well, you know, the final and ideal outcome of this research, which is was a quantification of digital audience diversity, uh, not just during the pandemic, but but beyond. Uh, trying to understand uh, well uh, how they have implemented different strategies, while at the same time trying to understand. Uh, well, what are their structural limitations and uh, without necessarily making them to or asking them too much about about money, which seems to be a big taboo in the cultural and arts sector. So uh, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you are well, you're welcome to uh, check uh, well Richard's uh, blog for uh, updates on the uh, project. So thank you. 
Thank you um, very much, Adrian, um, for your presentation. Let's just, uh, without further ado, um, uh, introduce your second speaker, um, who is um, uh, Dr. Thomas Swan, uh, who is a lecturer in political theory here in the School of um, Social Sciences and Humanities, and his research focuses on the connections between anarchist and cybernetic theories of organization and their application to alternative forms of organizing. And Thomas has just published uh, a book last year entitled Anarchist Cybernetics, Control and Communication in Radical uh, Politics. So um, Thomas' presentation entitled The Viability of Self-Organized Mutual Aid During the COVID Pandemic um, uh, focuses on another really interesting aspects of um, adaptation to the to life um, on in the pandemic. So Thomas, the floor is all yours. Yes, I just want to kind of preface what I'm going to say by saying it's what I'm going to say is quite um, a more sort of conceptual level, um, and it's also relatively introductory because I think there's a few sort of um, you know concepts and ideas that I'm going to be throwing out here that people might not be familiar with. Um, so it's not going to be a sort of grounded in, in data as some of the other presentations, but I will still build on, on some of the analysis that, that I have been doing. Um, so I want to start by defining three of the main terms that I'm going to use in this presentation. Um, so firstly, anarchism. So here's Noam Chomsky, a renowned linguist and lifelong anarchist. Um, anarchism calls for a highly organised society organised by the participants without illegitimate hierarchy and domination. It calls for a high degree of organisation, but based on solidarity, mutual concern, cooperation, shared information and understanding. So whatever you might think when you hear the word anarchism, it is in fact a way of thinking about how society can be structured that minimises or even eliminates um, top-down hierarchical control and that maximises the freedom of individuals and groups. So the second term I want to use is cybernetics. And as Stafford Beer, um, one of the most famous theorists and practitioners of cybernetics defined it, cybernetics is the science of effective organisation. So cybernetics deals with how organisations can be effective in achieving their goals and in handling complex and changing situations. And a really important point for, for cybernetics is that organisations work best when the different parts have a high degree of autonomy. So John Walker, another cybernetician, says effective organisational structure can be based upon individual freedom. Authoritarian management is not the only alternative. And the final term that I'm going to be using here is mutual aid. So here's author and journalist Rebecca Solnit. Mutual aid has generally meant aid offered in a spirit of solidarity and reciprocity. When coming from within struggling communities, empowering those aided and with an eye towards liberation and social change. And famous examples of mutual aid include the Black Panthers Free Breakfast Program in the US, um, which fed over 10,000 children a day at its height, um, and also disaster relief efforts after Hurricanes Katrina and Sandy, for example. And importantly, these and other examples of mutual aid operate outside formal government agencies and are often organised from the bottom up democratically. And over the last year, mutual aid has become quite a popular term thanks to the ways in which communities have responded to the COVID-19 pandemic by organising themselves, in many cases without any government support, to ensure that everyone has access to food, medicine and other necessities. And what I want to do here is use the first two terms I introduced, anarchism and cybernetics, to get an idea of how the third mutual aid works. The mechanism that I'm using here is Stafford Beer's viable system model. Beer designed this as a way of diagnosing the problems organisations face and helping them increase their effectiveness. And he applied it in a lot of businesses, as well as in Chile during Salvador Allende's socialist government. But it's also been used in workers' cooperatives and the focus in it on autonomy and self-organisation 
means that it can be a powerful tool for thinking through anarchist organisation. And while the mutual aid groups that sprang up in response to COVID-19 certainly weren't all anarchists, the viable system model can be of use because these groups need to be effective and they are often self-organised outside of hierarchical structures like governments or charities and in many cases working with autonomy and democracy in mind. Key to the viable system model and to organisational effectiveness are two factors. The first is the organisational structure. And there's a separation in the viable system model between operations on the one hand, the activities that an organisation does day to day, and the meta system. So the functions that help coordinate these activities. And the second key factor is communication. The parts of the organisation need to be able to gather and share information and talk back and forth to ensure that coordination functions of the meta system can work properly. And the diagrams on the slide here show some of the ways that the viable system model has been expressed. And although these diagrams are arranged hierarchy, arranged vertically up and down, the functions don't need to work like a hierarchy. So everyone who's involved in the basic activities of an organisation can also be involved in making decisions about coordination. And the viable system model contends that with the right mix of autonomy and coordination, organisations can adapt to complex environments better and quicker than those that are structured hierarchically. I'm going to look at mutual aid self-organisation with an attention first to organisational structure, second to communication. And after that, I'm going to consider some of the other conditions that need to be in place for effective self-organised mutual aid. The analysis here that I'm doing is, is based on examining um, some of the many anarchist reflections on mutual aid and COVID-19 that have been published online over the last year. And reading these through a lens provided by an, an anarchist framing of cybernetics a lens concerned with freedom and democracy as well as effectiveness. And this analysis also draws in part on my own experience uh, in, in a mutual aid group. So mutual aid groups are made up of individuals and subgroups of a few individuals that tend to operate with a high level of autonomy within a specific niche, either a geographical area perhaps a neighbourhood or even just one or two streets, or around specific tasks such as food delivery, dog walking, mental health support, gardening, etc. And the coordination can, can be in, informal, but it can also happen more formally in meetings for everyone in a larger area or of delegates of different subgroups. And this coordination is where we see things like planning, both for the immediate situation and for the future, and policy type um, decisions taking place. The people in these groups might not, might not always frame things in anarchist or cybernetic terms, but often these same self-organised arrangements of functions will develop. Because they offer a high degree of autonomy, these networks can adapt to things as they happen, but they are also coordinated ensuring, for example, that safety protocols um, or, or, or the key ethical commitments of mutual aid are in place in these autonomous subgroups and in the actions of individuals. And one of the main threats to these groups is being co-opted by politicians, by local or national government and by charities. And while perhaps well-meaning, um, this often entails an imposition of more hierarchical decision-making processes. Ultimately, this makes these groups or risks making them less reliant, less resilient, as, for example, people have to report up the chain of command and then wait for orders to come back down. And in a rapidly changing environment like that of COVID-19, where there are at times very complex, very changing needs in play, these kind of structures struggle to act as effectively as flatter, less hierarchical ones. Pretty much everything that happens in mutual aid groups involves communication, uh, from people letting others know that they need certain support, 
to groups getting the word out to neighbours that they are there to, to, to support them. From coordination and planning, being able to take into account the situations faced by different groups and individuals, to the policies and procedures that um, groups develop for complex cases being made available to everyone who needs them. As groups increase in size, the communication landscape can become very complex. While groups active over a couple of streets where people already know each other can communicate quite effectively in pretty informal ways, larger groups start to see more complicated means of communication coming to the fore. And a common complaint of those involved in mutual aid groups is that juggling various Google Docs, WhatsApp chat groups, email threads, social media discussions and teamwork platforms like Slack, for example, um, becomes a massive drain on time and energy. This complex communication landscape can privilege people used to working with these kinds of technologies, such as younger professionals or, dare I say it, academics and risks excluding others from key functions. This in, in turn makes groups fundamentally less effective. Because of people's time being taken up, navigating different communication channels and getting overwhelmed, and also due to stru structures becoming more hierarchical as coordination tasks are increasingly specialised and distanced from what are supposed to be the main activities of the group. What is perhaps less obvious than organisational structure and communication is the wide array of other conditions that seem to be necessary or at the very least conducive to effective mutual aid. As well as skills to help navigate different means of communication and the capacity of groups to resist being co-opted, the most effective mutual aid groups often build on a wealth of both experience and trust. To be able to ask for help, for example, people need to trust those that they're offering. And in the context of social distancing, this kind of trust can be difficult to build. While there are ways to bridge this trust gap, there are also things that groups might do that make it harder to overcome. And this is perhaps compounded by the fact that in the UK, for example, and in a lot of other places, we aren't really socialised for this kind of activity. Now, the economic system that many of us are raised in promotes competition and individualism and strong community ties can be weakened as a result. Groups with experience of doing similar kinds of work, perhaps even earlier manifestations of mutual aid, may find it easier to do things like effective coordination because everyone already knows the ropes even if the scale and environment is slightly different. And a thread running through a lot of these conditions, I would argue, is the austerity many governments have enforced since the 2008 financial crash. With a lot of public services out of reach and em employment increasingly insecure, the mental and physical strain on people is so great that engaging in something like mutual aid in a self-organised way can be very difficult. So what conclusions should we draw from this? First, the people involved in mutual aid need to guard against group, groups being co-opted. This isn't to say that there must be a total separation between mutual aid and charity, for example, but that relationships should be navigated with care. Second, if people are excluded from overly complicated communication practices, then the coordination that can help groups be effective risks being more of a hindrance. So communication must be simplified as much as possible. Third, we need to think seriously about the other conditions that contribute to the effectiveness of mutual aid. Something we can do right away is start building bonds of community. We can find ways of developing shared skills in our neighbourhoods and making sure a lot of the underlying structures of mutual aid are in place. And importantly, mutual aid is a practice that reinforces its own conditions. Um, so people engaging in mutual aid are actually building the kind of community that is necessary for it to be effective in the future. And we can also look at the kind of policies that might make this easier. 
at the local level, could a major devolution of resources and democratic control help mutual aid thrive? More broadly, could things like universal basic income, well-funded and well-governed well public services, secure employment contracts, even perhaps something like universal free internet access, allow communities to better prepare for coming crises? Whether these reforms can be realistically achieved is, of course, another question. If the chances of any of this happening anytime soon seem bleak, try to remember that mutual aid isn't a luxury or an activity for the privileged in society, or something that only activists with experience can do. Peter Kropotkin, the anarchist geographer who coined the term mutual aid, didn't invent the idea. It was something he observed in human societies throughout history and even in animal groups. People will always find ways of engaging in mutual aid, however big or small these activities are. What I'm hoping that an anarchist and cybernetic analysis of mutual aid during the COVID-19 pandemic can do is show how these natural tendencies can be strengthened and made as effective as possible. A lot of this might feel like an uphill struggle, overcoming what can appear as insurmountable obstacles. So I want to end on a hopefully happier note with a couple of quotations. First, from the anarchist science fiction writer Ursula K. Le Guin. We live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. And lastly, from the anarchist anthropologist David Graeber, who sadly died last year. The ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something that we make and could just as easily make differently. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Thomas, especially for an ending full of um, um, optimism. Um, and uh, I'm sure that optimism will also come from our last presentation on a form of adaptation to the pandemic uh, that I think we've all had, have had some experience of. Um, so um, our colleague uh, Marcus Collins will um, give us a, a paper on post-pandemic pedagogy, lessons learned from learning and teaching history during COVID. And Marcus um, Collins is a senior lecturer in uh, cultural history. He researches British contemporary history and has a particular interest in the 1960s, the so-called permissive society and the Beatles, so all of the coolest things um, on which he has written extensively. And Marcus is about to uh, join us from a very peaceful garden, it seems. So Marcus, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can I just um, first of all say that I'm going to disillusion you horribly if optimism is what you're looking for. Um, the other thing is, can you actually see the screen? Um, I've got a yes, message. Yes, we have you. You can. Brilliant. OK, well, let me get going because I have more slides than I have minutes. Um, so um, post pandemic pedagogy. Um, this is a subject I think that most of us um, who are academics have pondered over after the last year. And the focus in this talk is very much on history, but I think the implications and the resonance um, are possibly extending further. I should ex I, I should um, emphasize this is these are interim results from an ongoing pilot study which is being conducted um, with two colleagues, one at Lincoln, the other at um, Keele. So um, this pilot study is taking place as we speak in six East Midlands universities. Later this week, um, a version of it is going to be rolled out nationally and talks are underway for um, international versions of the same survey. I'm also conducting a um, separate but related study on transition of history students from school to university um, in this era of COVID. And all of these um, studies are being done in cooperation with and with sponsorship from, in some cases, um, subject associations at a regional and national and international level. So, um, 
so far we've got just over 100 responses. Two thirds of them have been from undergraduates and two thirds of those undergraduates are first years. Just under a hundred, sorry, just under a third of the staff uh, of the total um, number of uh, participants in the survey are staff. The remainder are made up of master's students and you can see the demographic breakdown at the bottom of the screen. So one of the unusual aspects of this survey is that it um, has done um, the task of asking identical or near identical questions to both staff and students. You'll be aware that virtually every university I can think of has been surveying its students um, extensively about their experiences of teaching and learning under lockdown and under pan the, the, and during the pandemic. Um, some universities have also been surveying staff, but what is rare is to have um, surveys which span several universities and specifically for the purposes of this project, ask the same questions of staff and students so we can get um, different perspectives on the same topics. Now, I say that they're identical or almost identical. In the case of first years, clearly first years have no pre-COVID experience of higher education. And so when we're asking second years and above, what I call advanced students, about comparing and contrasting um, their education before and during COVID, um, those questions clearly can't be asked of first years. This is a mixed method survey, so um, I'm gratified that uh, the vast majority of people took some time to provide free text answers to open questions as well as ticking boxes. So in the first set of questions, what I was doing was asking staff and these advanced students in the second year and above to compare 13 aspects of teaching and learning before and after March 2020. And the bottom line for these, and again, I apologies to Ellie, is that there is um, a sense of a worsening teaching and learning experience in almost every respect. All of these graphs aren't showing people who think things remain the same or people who didn't respond to the question or didn't know the, their response to the question. Um, but in this case, as you can see, you've got um, particularly in terms of students, um, a, um, a large proportion who, um, in fact, an absolute majority, who think that their own learning has worsened um, since the onset of COVID in March 2020. You can see similar trends, although less pronounced when they're asked about teaching methods. Um, teacher student interaction is unsurprisingly given very low marks um, for the period during COVID. Assessment, there's less of a, um, th th there's less of a tendency to think things are worsening. In fact, for students, um, this is, there's only a slight tendency in that direction. And a lot of people on that question think that things are roughly as before. Um, there is only one question of these 13 where there was a um, plurality of people who thought things were getting better and that was staff who thought that their feedback was um, superior under COVID than had been the case before. Um, but the feedback from students on the feedback they were getting from staff wasn't so um, wasn't so forgiving and so they thought that feedback had deteriorated in that respect as in others. When we look at sort of net scores, so subtracting um, people who think that things are getting worse from people who think things are getting better, um, we can see that feedback is the area where staff and these advanced students in second year and above um, there's the greatest disparity in their viewpoints. And these other three aspects below that um, also show um, strong 
uh, strongly more pronounced negative responses from students, and that includes students' own learning. The next set of numbers, um, the disparity is slightly less pronounced, and in all of these cases, um, it's the staff who are more pessimistic. And then for the final three aspects, um, there isn't very much difference between staff and advanced student um, responses. Now, I've already mentioned that we can't ask first year students to compare um, the situation before and after COVID when it comes to learning and teaching in universities. Um, learning under COVID in university is the only higher education that they have experienced. However, what we did was we asked them instead to rate these 13 aspects of teaching and learning, and um, they did so on a Likert scale, which um, interestingly, and again, I emphasize these are not directly comparable to the before after questions, but what's interesting is, first of all, that um, first year students are generally quite satisfied with their education. Um, in fact, only one of these 13 aspects, um, they are more likely to say their experience has been poor than has been good. And there are also particular areas where they are particularly um, satisfied, which um, contradict the areas where teaching staff and advanced students are most concerned. So in things like access to secondary sources, um, which you see as the last but one of these categories on the um, on the screen. Now, um, I mentioned that it was a mixed method survey. I mentioned that we've got um, free text responses. What I forgot to mention was that I've not really analysed these in any great detail, but the first year responses um, that you see here, which are fairly representative of what first years say about what they um, liked about teaching and learning, suggest that what they're doing is, although they've not been asked to do it, they're providing implicit comparisons between their experience at university and their experience at school. So some of the things that we take for granted of learning and teaching in university, um, like essay based assessments, for example, in the um, quotation from in the middle, um, those things um, are the things that they like and don't have a sort of um, idea of whether those assessments were better or worse before COVID. Um, OK, so the second um, section of the survey was asking people to then proceed to compare their experiences before COVID with their preferences for teaching practice after COVID. So what did they want to see um, after COVID? Did they want to have a continuation of what the kind of teaching changes that have been introduced since March 2020? Or did they want to go back to this sort of status quo anti-pandemic? In the case of seminars, um, that was the case. They wanted to revert to what they had previously known, in other words, in-person teaching. And anybody who has spent the last year looking at screens like this um, can see the merits of that particular case. In terms of lectures, um, there wasn't the appetite to return to um, how things had been. So lectures, of an in-person variety have been a mainstay of university education for the best part of a thousand years. They survived the Black Death. I don't think that, that traditional lectures are going to survive the um, COVID pandemic um, intact. So you can see minorities of both staff and advanced students wishing to return to an in-person only experience. Now on that, um, staff and advanced students were pretty united. Um, the same does not go for the experience of um, assessment. So when they're asked about um, whether they want closed book exams, you can see that um, staff um, are less keen to go back to closed book exams 
um, than um, had been their experience of closed book exams before. However, um, in terms of advanced students, not a single student um, expressed a preference to go back to closed book exams. OK, um, so this could be that, you know, if you give any student the chance to say, do you want to take an exam? It's kind of like, like asking, you know, turkeys to vote for Christmas. And so they would have said this irrespective of the pandemic. I think the difference is that they've got accustomed to not taking the traditional um, timed exam in an exam hall without notes. And um, this is going to be very hard to reinstate. Um, OK, so the last thing I'm going to do for the purposes of this is to throw the first year numbers into the mix. So these are all looking at preferences after the pandemic. And what I'm trying to point out with these yellow arrows is that first years um, have the least enthusiasm for um, the most traditional of teaching methods. In other words, in-person lectures, seminars, supervisions. OK, so they are the most radical, it seems, so far from these interim findings, these provisional re results. Um, they're also the least keen to um, have simply written feedback um, and they're less keen than advanced students to conduct their independent study in libraries or on campus, although um, when it comes to exams, it's the advanced students who are the most resistant to um, any um, return to the traditional exam. So um, to conclude, um, well, the first conclusion is that these results so far are inconclusive in the sense that we've only interviewed, uh, sorry, surveyed 100 people and the whole purpose of rolling this out nationally and internationally is to get multiple numbers of this um, of respondents and therefore also be able to explore some things such as EDI issues, which so far are very difficult to do with the small numbers um, of minority students that we've so far been able to um, get to participate. Um, Conclusion number one, however, is that people are overwhelmingly negative about their teaching and learning over the course of the last year or so. Um, I think people are on the whole are fairly forbearing and forgiving, understanding this is an emergency situation, but they don't think that they have um, just been able to adapt and learn as well as they're used to. The second thing is that I think there's no turning back. Um, I don't think that um, if COVID was wiped out 100% tomorrow, um, there is the will amongst staff and students um, to return to how things were. I think we are living in pedagogical terms in a revolutionary moment. The third thing is I think that some of these revolutionary changes will be divisive because I think that they um, have done two things. I think that one is that there are different interests, different concerns um, being expressed by different groups which are ultimately pretty irreconcilable. I mean, staff are wanting um, teaching to achieve some things that students aren't necessarily wanting the same. And I think that there is a real change in mentality amongst students, which comes at a time when student power um, is in a sort of 1968 moment. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marcus. And you'll be pleased to hear that your you were in perfect. Uh, your timing was perfect. Um, so um, I think that we are now ready to go into the um, questions. So please, um, we have some questions that I'm, um, I have some questions, um, but please feel free to post them in the Q&A session. So the first question is indeed for you, Marcus, um, from uh, Lee Stoko. And so Lee asks, 
How do you think asking the same questions about both experiences, but at the same time, for instance, during the pandemic might be relevant? And how does this compare to pre-pandemic research on student preferences in relation to different modalities for teaching when different things were at stake? Rogers at all at all pointed out in 2020 that, um, and that's the quote, well-planned online learning experiences are meaningfully different from courses offered online in response to a crisis or a disaster. Universities working to maintain instruction during the COVID-19 pandemic should understand those differences when evaluating this emergency remote teaching, end quote. So um, quite an interesting question there, Marcus. What do you think? Well, um, I think you've answered your own question to a large extent, Liz. I think that, yeah, I think that there that what we have been doing is all hands to the pump in the last year and that this is not the same as being, you know, designing the open university from scratch and working out how to do distance learning properly or semi distance learning properly. Um, what I think is interesting, though, is that um, in, when I speak to colleagues internationally, um, they are much more inclined to say, well, yeah, you know, it was an emergency. We did our best. And now, you know, we're going to go back to um, what we were doing before. You know, what was wrong with what we were doing before? Um, I don't get that sense, same sense in Britain. I, um, it doesn't seem to me that any university is going to be prepared to say, OK, you know, it was a bit like the Second World War and, you know, we all just sort of, you know, signed up and um, did our duty and now we're going to return to civilian life, as it were. That doesn't seem to be a sentiment that has a lot of traction in the British university system. And I think it's very interesting why that might be the case. Um, but before I do the international survey, I'm not going to really have any um, answers beyond the anecdotal. Uh, well, we'll have to just be patient and wait because I'd be really curious to, to know why, why the um, attitude or their response um, has been so different here in the UK because I think talking to the league I also spot that different uh, approach. Thank you, thank you Marcus. The second question we have is for Thomas and the question is uh, from Alex C. Um, so the question is why do you think so many people seem to assume that getting something sorted requires a leader and consequently a hierarchy. And to what extent do you reckon people's experience of mutual aid networks during COVID will alter these assumptions? Yeah, thank you. That's a really, really good question. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, th I, th I think the, what, one of the reasons I think about why why hierarchies seem to be so so dominant in people's imaginations is because it's that that's kind of the only thing a lot of us know. You know, most most organisations we're ever part of, whether that's you know going from school. Um, right through our working lives. <clears throat> a lot of organisations may be part of outside of our working lives or, or seem to be organised in a very hierarchical way and it so sort of looks like that's the only way to get things done. Um, I mean one of the really important points that Stafford Beer, the cybernetician I talked about, um, says is that you know or, or organisations actually function in spite of these rigid, rigid hierarchies. Okay so, so we can have the very you know, top-down organisational chart um, but actually, the way the way organisations work is that people find ways around this. People find their own, you know, ways of solving problems and stuff. And that's that's actually how organisations are, are are successful. But still, they're presented as these hierarchies, and so it looks like that's that's the only way things can get done. Um, and I think that that sort of that 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 um, in, in in people's imaginations, that's that's very dominant. Um, I'm kind of reminded of there's a fantastic quotation from um, the, the, the theorist Mark Fisher, who says about, you know, that it's, it's easier to imagine the end of capitalism. Sorry, it's, it's e easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And I think that is kind of similar for, for hierarchy. You know, it's, it's the only thing we know. It's very hard to think outside of that. Um, whether COVID and the mutual aid um, experience has been enough of a, 
a, a sort of shock to that to that um, system to actually get people thinking differently. I'm not sure at the start of the pandemic I would have said yes, um, but I think perhaps the the way the the sort of vaccine rollouts have been have been um, articulated in government discourse and um, actually just kind of reinforces um, the idea that we know that the government is the one who can come in and, and, and save the day. You know, obviously that's not how, you know, vaccines were developed through networks of scientists working all over the world, sharing information, you know, developing these things, um, but they're very much presented as here's the government giving you the vaccine now everything's going to be fantastic so that does risk just reinforcing that sort of very hierarchical um, way of thinking about solutions to problems thank you uh thank you thomas and certainly the uh, local elections in england seem to confirm that point um uh yes absolutely so um i think we have just a handful of minutes left, so I think if you've got some um, uh, pressing question, please put it in the Q&A um, and we might be able to um, come to it. Um, but in the meantime, I have one question for um, Adrian, who is joined in the Q&A session by his PI, Dr um, Richard Misek. So I think actually that's probably a question for, um, for you, um, Adrian, but Richard, feel free to uh, come into it if it's relevant. Um, and also, this is a question, Adrian, uh, that comes, as you know, um, from somebody who is more um, comfortable, perhaps, with qualitative research than quantitative research, which Adrian knows because we worked together on a big project and he has, you know, spent a lot of time trying to explain um, to me, um, you know, um, statistical analysis of uh, cultural participation data. Um, uh, so I was intrigued by um, the what you said in the slides when you were um, talking about the different data sources that your project will look at. And you had um, a bullet point that talked about statistical analysis of arts and cultural programmes. Um, and and I was just wondering, and, and, and so that alongside, um, uh, you know, your ad data, you thought that um, could offer insights in that can eventually lead to higher engagement from uh, a, diverse, a more diverse range of audiences than it is now. And so that is the usual type of any question. And, that, you know, can you explain how, what do you mean by a statistical analysis of cultural programme? I mean, how do you know, how, how do you, Go about doing that, but also how can that help you get the kind of insight that can let that can then eventually lead to a different kind of programming that is more is attractive to perhaps wider ranges of the population. And I hope that that even makes sense as a question, Adrian, or that I am not showing up my um, quantitative, um, uh, you know flaws uh, in understanding by even asking that question. Uh, yeah, it makes sense. Thanks, uh, Ellen. Um, well, I think that the, 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 the statistical analysis of, 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 of programming refers mostly to uh, to what, what we can, at least from, from, from what we have at the moment, from, uh, from what, what we can possibly quantify from the survey data that is available on cultural organizations. Uh, but uh, yeah, but that is that is not something that we can necessarily extract from, for example, audience data. So it is, it is more on the uh, on the um, on the uh, well qualitative uh, interview interview data, as you might you might expect. Uh, to an extent, it was a bit of a of a, of a surprising uh, discovery uh, to to realize that there, that uh, there is information from from the Arts Council. On on uh, self-reported uh, variety of, of cultural cultural programming, which can uh, complement uh, to an extent uh, what what we can we can we can uh, we can find from uh, from other 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 sources. Of course, that is highly limited because it is self-reported. Uh, it is also only uh, from uh, well English organizations. Uh, being funded by this flagship program national national portfolio so it, it is very very specific but nonetheless we we can already see some 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 interesting patterns like 
for example, how large organizations have capacity to at least include one activity a year, and then they look slightly better than than than, not, than others that that don't do anything. So, uh, and then of course, it, there is this difference between organizations that focus more on families or on, on specific age groups, uh, while others have a more focus on uh, disability or pain or even socioeconomics. So yeah, that's that's the way I see it, and yeah, I'm I'm sure that 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 Richard uh, can can also well complement a bit on that because we, we have had some conversation actually on what's the role of programming and 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 the uh, the the study of of programming in the context of our project. So Richard, yeah. Richard, do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I'll make it very quick as it's, I guess it's half past five, but um, I mean, speaking as somebody who also comes from a qualitative background rather than a quantitative background, I think one, um, one change in my perspective has been that of beginning to understand the value of, of quantitative data um, and the power of it, um, which is not directly answering your question, but um, I mean, one specific thing that Adrian and I have discovered is, I think Adrian mentioned it, that organizations aren't wanting to find out uh, the socioeconomic data um, about their audiences um, because they don't want to know, you know, ignorance is bliss and that might be a very difficult answer for them to receive. And if they knew it, then they would have to do something about it. And so in a way, sort of, you know, just sort of putting your fingers in your ears around the quantitative data um, is the easiest thing for them to do. And so actually just knowing what the data is and being able to present it to um, players within the arts sector is actually a very powerful thing um, and something which seems quite an aspiration, something it's, it's, there's a lot of resistance to. Um, so I think, you know, numbers, numbers do certainly have power. Um, in that sense, at least. Absolutely, absolutely. That, you know, reflects a lot of my own work. So I was sort of giggling uh, cynically, as you were saying, that arts organisations don't want to know. They don't want to know because they kind of know and it's difficult um, what they know. Um, absolutely. And perhaps, you know, an outcome of this project might also be to um, to tell the sector actually what other data should be collected and why and to pressure the funders to make them because I think ultimately you might have to be um they might have to be compelled so excellent well I look forward to see what um what else you find and how what you find is um received by the um, arts and cultural sector so let me check I think we are um we don't have any further questions which is um possibly a good thing as we are already three minutes it's on the schedule um, of a schedule although considering the packed program that we had I think that's quite um quite um impressive uh, outcome so I will um uh thank thank first of all all our speakers for their generosity in in, in sharing their current work with us today and then the audiences for um listening and engaging um, and um, we have recorded this event and so um, I will uh, probably pass over the um, floor to um, Christian Vakari uh, who can tell you more about that and then also say uh, his thanks and goodbyes but before I do that I just wanted to let you know of a fabulous PhD student um, called um, Rachel Armitage who has been incredibly helpful in um, supporting uh, me and Christian by producing the event behind the scenes. So you won't have seen her, you won't have heard her, but this would not really have run so smoothly without her. So thank you very much, Rachel. Um, and Christian, do you want to say something about the recording? Thank you and goodbye from me. Yes, sure. I want to join Ellie in thanking all our presenters, uh, all those who attended and absolutely thank you, Rachel, for doing an amazing job. Uh, we've been experimenting with a new version of Teams that hopefully will uh, generate better recordings and a smoother experience for people. And Rachel has been really crucial in running it as smoothly as possible. Just wanted to say, yes, that as for all our events uh, that we have been running online in, these day, in this new era, uh, the recordings will be available shortly. Please be on the lookout, uh, whether you follow our Twitter account, um, Elboro CRCC or uh, our blog, 
uh, we will post an announcement as soon as all the videos are being produced. And uh, I think we have all learned a lot this afternoon. We have learned if we didn't need it, if we didn't need any reminding that communication is being crucial, culture is being crucial, ideas have been crucial in both how we understand the pandemic, how we act to protect each other and how we adapt to it. So lots of food for thought. And again, uh, thanks everyone for participating and have a good night. Thank you.